Facebook. As uh, you just heard, I'm the director of the public policy program here at Franklin and Marshall, uh, also a faculty member in the Department of Earth and Environment. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Howard Newkrug, who's a longtime friend and colleague in environmental protection, as well as uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, where we both teach in the uh, Master of Environmental Studies and the undergraduate programs in environmental science. As commissioner of the Philadelphia Water Department in, in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Howard Newkrug is the chief executive of the Philadelphia Water Utility, where he's responsible for providing safe and affordable drinking water and integrated wastewater and stormwater services for more than 2 and 2.3 million people. Commissioner Newkrug is a national leader for urban sustainability and the creator of Philadelphia's Green Cities Clean Water Program, considered a model for partnerships between major U.S. cities and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He's a professional engineer and board certified environmental engineer and a graduate in civil and urban engineering from the University of Pennsylvania, where he currently teaches two courses, the water industry in the 21st century and green cities, clean waters, which is the topic of his talk here with us today. Please welcome Commissioner Howard Newkrug. Good afternoon, everybody, or I guess still good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming out here. This is a quite, I've never been to uh, Franklin Marshall before, and I'm quite honored to be here. Thank you all very much. Uh, and I'm Howard Newkrug. I'm uh, the Water Commissioner of Philadelphia. Uh, we do, what, what's interesting about the City of Philadelphia, water utility is different from other water utilities throughout the country, is that we have an integrated service. And you'll see why this is important for me to tell you now. Uh, a little bit later on in our talk, but uh, basically do drinking water services, watershed protection, uh, wastewater services, uh, uh, stormwater management, flooding issues, uh, and water resources of our rivers, the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers. And looking at it all together and figuring out, and those of you who are in the environmental uh, sciences or environmental studies area, probably know that the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act are two very, very separate pieces of legislation. And from that, it's been very difficult in our industry and in our world to be able to actually consider everything as one water. Uh, we're looking at drinking water and drinking water issues and wastewater and wastewater issues. My three greatest challenges, uh, at least this morning when I wrote this, put this slide together, is uh, rebuilding the water infrastructure in Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia is an old city. We have lots and lots and lots of old water mains. Average age is about 67 years. I have pipes in the ground that were put there before 1870. And uh, about 3,000 miles of this. We also have uh, three water plants and three wastewater plants. An incredible amount of, of effort needs to be put in over the next 10, 20 years to rebuild, renew, replace this, uh, this architecture. Uh, the second thing is raising revenues. We're a very poor city. And in the water industry, 98% of all the um, funding for your water comes from you. It's all locally, uh, it's all locally raised. Unlike in the um, uh, transportation industry where 85% of the money that goes that into any roadway is typically coming from the federal and state governments. So it's very local and we're looking for this money and how do you do that, particularly in a very poor city. And the last thing that I just want to touch on is, is, is this concept of designing and building for the future, whether it's how many people are going to live in Philadelphia in 50 years, or what's the weather going to be like in 50 years, and how are we going to met balance that? And with that, we've, we're starting to use this term of uh, stationarity. And I don't know, uh, uh, anybody here know what stationarity is? Nobody. Okay, well, a couple months ago, we had a 50-year storm in Philadelphia. Why was it a 50-year storm? It was a 50-year storm because we looked past that history of, of, of water for the last 100 years. And we've seen, well, over that course of 100 years, it's most likely you're going to see two of these storms. And therefore, we call it a 50-year storm. So stationary is the concept of looking at a time series backwards, finding some correlations, and then assuming that's what you're going to happen moving forward. Stationarity no longer exists, or at least it appears not to exist. When I go into a, a, a gymnasium like this in a poor neighborhood in Philadelphia to talk to people about a flooding issue, 
And uh, uh, I say, well, you have to understand, you just experienced a 400-year storm. And they just laugh at me. And why, you know, I go, why are you laughing? And they go, because we had a storm just like this three weeks ago. So there's, uh, there's something happening. We don't know if it's a short trend or a long-term trend. But uh, we are going to the assumption now that stationary may, stationarity may no longer exist. And this is a quote from the US EPA about that, where, where there's increasing concern regarding the future validity of natural systems assumptions upon which basically everything, standards, permit conditions, water use, and delivery obligations are all based. Everything that we decide about how much water we need for this building, for this campus, for this part of this part of the world is questioning. We're questioning now whether we're going to have sufficient water, whether it's going to rain too much, have too much flooding, et cetera. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go to uh, the Netherlands uh, about eight years ago on a, a class trip looking at sea level rise. And there we met the, uh, the dike master of Delft. That's uh, Dick Graf, I don't know, I don't know Dutch, but that's uh, Dutch for dike master. And uh, he was talking to us and showing us about the, the dikes that they're building all over Amsterdam and all over Holland uh, to deal with these storms that they had in these, in these various years and diff different centuries going way back. And as you know, they've been very successful in dealing with, with this kind of management. And they've been building and building and raising dikes. And because of a, a big flood in the 1950s, they're still in 2015 raising the dikes because the 1950s flood showed them that the dikes were not big enough or strong enough. But the dike master, while we were walking around seeing some of this, made this comment. We raise the dikes another meter, and the coming catastrophe will be that much bigger. Okay. What does that mean? Well, we looked down uh, the river a bit, also in Holland, at the Wall River. And there, they're trying to look at different ways of doing things. They're saying, Maybe dikes, maybe these strong, hard foundations are not necessarily the way we should be managing everything we do about water. And there they decided to run the river through the city and move the city so that they can deal with floods and deal with, the, uh, what, with what might happen and will probably happen in the future. This is some diagrams of how they did that, the, uh, how the, how the area looked at first, and then at the bottom here, in the bottom right, how the, um, how the area looks after they built this channel and added um, uh, new recreation, new homes, new businesses, moved the city, and made the city something very special by having a river on two sides of it. And there, the, uh, one of the people who are responsible for doing this, he had a very similar quote to the dike master. He said, after 800 years of building dikes, we've been making them higher and higher. But if something goes wrong, the damage will be greater. We need to remain flexible in adapting to climate change. So now we try to remove the bottlenecks. Okay. That philosophy is very much what the philosophy is of the Green Cities Clean Waters program is in Philadelphia and much of the United States today as we're trying to relook at how things are designed and how we plan things and think about things for the future. So the, the question really is for us is, is how do we adapt modern US water policy to encourage innovation and growth and sustainability of a great water city like Philadelphia, or Lancaster, or New York City. What do we do? Well, there are two ways to create change. I think a lot of you know this, either through crisis or through leadership. The problem with crisis is that we've been having crisis uh, out west with drought. Anything change in terms, you know, a couple of little things have changed in terms of policy, but basically uh, nothing big has, has changed because of that. Uh, we had uh, cyanotoxins in uh, Toledo, so couldn't drink the water for several days this past summer. Um, people were thinking about making some actions on that, but really that crisis has gone and passed, and I'm not sure anything's really going to be changing. And this is, uh, you know, this is the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia, and this is a uh, uh, a regular event at this point in time, and regular event, uh, you watch TV, any uh, national news, you can see this somewhere in the world, somewhere in the US almost every day. So there's this thought that it's riskier to continue to do business the way we did as civil engineers and as uh, planners of cities for the last 200 years, last thousand years, than it is today. Maybe, maybe we need to change a little bit in what our philosophy is. 
Um, this gives you a little bit of an example of the things that I'm responsible for at Philadelphia Water. It's everything about water except for the rain itself. Once the rain hits the ground, it becomes, uh, becomes a responsibility, a burden on the Philadelphia Water Utility and other land managers to manage that water. And we have a, a number of big issues, and obviously it's protecting our source waters on the Schuylkill River and the Delaware River and protecting them from terrorism and from endocrine disruptor, disruptors and other things that are going on. Uh, we're looking at uh, all different kinds of land management because we're recognizing the whole title of Green City, Clean Water is this recognition that land matters. If you're going to improve water, you have to improve the land. There is a connection there. So a lot of this is about those connections and how we treat water and, and manage water. And at the very bottom here, which is very interesting for Philadelphia, is this um, enhanced economy, the sustainable city region, and looking to see how everything that we do as a water utility, which impacts all these things, also impacts the economy in Philadelphia. So how do we manage the economy in Philadelphia? And, and, how do, and you know, I said before, we're a very poor city. So for a poor city, I have a problem because, as you'll see, the costs of my programs are in the billions. And who's going to pay for it? Well, today, only the locals can pay for it. So how do the locals pay for it when everyone is poor? Well, we look at this concept of how you take water and manage a city, improve a city, make it more sustainable, and by making a city more sustainable, you're bringing additional people, and we're seeing a start of a population increase in Philadelphia, and we're seeing an increase in incomes in Philadelphia. As that happens, uh, I have people who can afford their water bill. So I can raise rates and do the work similar to what they're doing in Holland. This is, the, uh, this is the picture of Philadelphia that uh, um, we like to show. It uh, represents what, wh how a lot of Philadelphians vi uh, vision their own city. Basically a green city with beautiful water, with a dense urban fabric behind it. And this is what we're really proud of. But this is the Philadelphia of South Philadelphia. This is, this is what a lot, a lot of Philadelphia looks like. And if you can imagine, not only do I have to make sure there's drinking water for these people, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Anytime anybody opens a, opens a faucet, there should be fresh, clean, safe water for people to drink. But also when it rains, somehow they expect the Philadelphia Water Utility to be able to take whatever rain comes down, whether it's a tenth of an inch or four inches or five inches of rain, and manage that somehow so that people don't get wet. This is, uh, this, this is Philadelphia about 200 years ago. Uh, uh, this is an urban stream map of what, of what we looked like. Uh, we're very much Philadelphia was, was designed as a city to, uh, um, uh, because it had so much water. There were so many resources that we had. But over the last 200 years, this is what it looks like now. I'm going to show you that again. This is what we were in the 1700s, and that's where we are now. What happened? Excuse me? Development. Can somebody tell me what's going on in this picture? Sir, in the front row. Do you know what's going on here? Anybody? Yeah, this, is, this picture is from, um, from 1870. OK? What you're looking at is a river valley. And here's a mill or a house that's by the river. You can't see the river because we took the river and we, and we put a, a sewer over it. And then we put that mound on top of that. Okay. And then we have these, these chimneys. Anybody know? Those are, the, those are the manholes. And the tops of those manholes represents where the land surface is going to be once they finished the development. We changed the city. This has happened all over the United States, all over the world. This is the way we, we manage things. This is the way we built things. This is why when you go to New York or Philadelphia, you rarely have to go over a bridge except when you're doing something like going over the Hudson or the, or the Delaware River. Uh, chances are you're going down a street, everything's going to be flat. This is what one of those sewers looks like. 
This is old Philadelphia again, 1700s, and why bury a stream in a, in a sewer? Well, there are four reasons. One is transportation access. You want people to be able to uh, have transport straight and direct, particularly in the days when there are only horses available and then only uh, horses pushing or, or pulling trolleys. Uh, streams became a public nuisance because uh, unlike in the first days of settlement here, when people kept putting their waste in their dead animals and the tannery factory wastes into these streams, it eventually got very polluted and no one liked to look at it. So look around as you, as you drive through Lancaster in the area here, area here and you see some of the streams. You can see the ones that are, that are protected and the ones that you see may not really mean that much. And maybe if there's another development in uh, Lancaster County, be, uh, uh, they'll bury that stream also. Uh, so this is some of the things that happened here. And it's also the easy drainage first because the rivers all go, all the streams in Philadelphia go to the, go to the river. Streams go to rivers, rivers go to oceans. Uh, so you have a natural slope, you have a hard surface, which is the, uh, the, base of the, the base of the stream. It's very easy to put a couple of uh, layers of bricks over it and be able to uh, then just send the waste directly to the river, discharge into the river, no treatment. And the last reason is because it's, uh, it's a lot better for developers if they're developing on a squared off block. Developers don't like to develop on a triangular block. So when you have rivers, they get in the way because they don't follow that, that natural pattern. So again, this is the map I showed you before, 1700. This time I'm showing you the, uh, uh, the sewer network in the city of Philadelphia. 3,000 miles of pipe, largely following the areas of the old, of the old streams. When we first built these, all the waste went out to the river. Anybody, uh, anybody been in Philadelphia in the 1950s? You know about the, uh, the, smell of, the smell of the Delaware River and the Schuylkill River and the jokes about the quality of the water. Um, well, they're very much true. I mean, we just had raw sewage going into the rivers and streams. Today, we have treatment plants. So all this waste is captured by something we call a, 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 a interceptor pipe. It intercepts all those outfalls, all those lines going into the river and brings it down to a treatment plant so everything can get treated. This is what one of those pipes looks like. This is probably the 1950s. But there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of water. And that pipe is kind of small. So even though when it's not raining, this pipe can take all the waste and bring it down to our treatment plants and treat it, when it does rain, the water needs a place to go. And it goes in these outfalls. I have 164 of these, and this is our largest, so they're not all this big, uh, but this can fill up about two-thirds full during a good rainstorm, pouring out into, in this, point, in the, uh, in this creek, this is the Tukani Tukoni Creek that empties into the Delaware River, creating pollution. So how do I keep sewage water <laughs> from overflowing our pipes into the river? Um, well, first, I can make it stop raining so much, which I, which I already told you I cannot do, I have no responsibilities for that. Uh, but I can do, there are only two things I can do. I can increase the capacity of the sewer system. I can increase the same thing we've been doing for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years, just making the system stronger and bigger, stronger and bigger. Or I can stop putting so much rainwater into that sewer. That's the green solution. That's green cities, clean waters. How do you keep water out of the sewer? How do you improve the landscape and make things better on land so that we're not spending all our money buried in the ground? So in Philadelphia, we're on, a, we're on the start of a verge of a very big change. We're looking at things totally differently. And we're not expecting that there's going to be a green roof on every doghouse in the city of Philadelphia. But we're, you know, we're, we're starting to think about how you do things a little differently. We're looking at this integrated approach of managing water looking at the land, water, the infrastructure underground, and then combining that with working with communities and looking at every square foot in the city of Philadelphia and wondering, what do we want this site to be like tomorrow? And what do we want this site to be like 100 years from now? And how are we going to get there? And it's a very strange thing for a water utility to be um, deeply involved in these discussions or even leading discussions at times. But at this point in history, it's really necessary. And the reason it's necessary is because um, the 
other option of building a, a big tunnel was very much upon us. And the day that I start building a big tunnel is the day that I and other water utilities stop caring about land management. Once you build the tunnel, you, your problem solved. We're doing it a little bit harder because we're saying, no, land's important. This is like um, uh, the electric industry where uh, I don't know how many of you have gotten new refrigerators and Pico or whoever your energy supplier out here is uh, uh, gave you a $50 check. Thank you very much for getting a more energy efficient uh, refrigerator. Here's some new, new light bulbs. Why don't you put these in? What they're doing is they're trying to get you to conserve so that they don't have to build the next nuclear power plant, the next coal powered plant. But the day that the decision's made that we just can't handle this anymore, we need to build that new nuclear power plant, is the day that they are no longer giving you $50 for an old refrigerator. They're instead sending you a letter saying, you know, you should have two refrigerators, put one in your basement. So it's, it's that philosophy that we're in, in that place in time, moment in time, that we're in, that we're in, in the water industry of, of do we build the nuclear power plant, the, the tunnel, which is to solve everybody's problems, or we do things the hard way through conservation, sustainability, and look at things a little bit differently. Our program's called Green Cities, Clean Waters. Uh, we broke ground on this. Uh, we've been working on this for about 15 years now. Uh, we've been in a uh, consent order with EPA and the state since uh, in June 2011. And we have a 25-year program to remove a lot of impervious cover from the city of Philadelphia, basically making the cover of Philadelphia more sponge-like and less hard so that it runs right into our sewer system. Okay. We're looking at every square foot in the city of Philadelphia and trying to figure out how we green, those, green these spaces, whether they be on parks or, or uh, streets or sidewalks. New construction, old construction in, private, in privately owned land, publicly owned land, and schoolyards. This is our promise to EPA, is that after five years, and five years is the end of 2016, that we will have green 750 acres. We've taken 750 acres of, if you can imagine, a, a one acre parking lot, uh, asphalt parking lot, and taken it, instead of that water draining into my sewer, going, getting hit and going out into the river, it's now going to be managed before it gets there. That's the concept. 750 acres of it. We're going to have, by the end of next year, about 1,000. We're ready for the, uh, for the next big hit, which is in uh, uh, 10 years or five years from now, which is 2,000 acres. We're comfortable we're going to get there. And our goal is 10,000 acres, 15 square miles of the city of Philadelphia, hard landscape, urban center, and managing that, which is three quarters, or I'm sorry, is one, one third of all the hard land area in the city of Philadelphia. We're gonna take it off of our sewer system, take it off the grid, and manage it. Here's just some numbers to give you an idea that a Green Acre, you know, Green Acre is, uh, is, is, uh, is measured in uh, uh, square feet, uh, 44,000 square feet in an acre. Uh, you, you manage the first inch of every rainfall from that. That's one green acre. That's equal to 27,000 gallons of water. If you have a one-inch storm landing on the city of Philadelphia, on, if you have one-inch storm landing on 10,000 green acres, you're removing 270 million gallons of water from my sewer system and managing it separately. So instead of creating a waste, we're doing something hopefully that's sustainable and reusable, renewable, infiltrating. Uh, uh, evaporating, um, making it, bringing it to groundwater, reusing, recycling, uh, using as cisterns, some way of managing this, this water for 10,000 acres. As I said, it's, uh, it's all about one water, one city, many places, and we're looking at communities and transit and uh, every possible uh, uh, land use that we could think of in the city of Philadelphia and creating a program because we take all these words and put the word green in front of it, so we have a green community program, a green transit program, green parking lot program, and uh, looking to see how do we manage it best. We're using a lot of uh, water, science, politics to come up with a scheme of how we're going to manage this and how we're going to make this happen. A lot of it is about innovation and demonstration. How do we? How does government, big government, come in and 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 uh, show how green infrastructure can work? And I'll show you some ex examples in a minute. Uh, but it's really also about development regulations and stormwater fees, financing uh, uh, private, uh, private entities, giving grants, other types of incentives, and 
and using market-driven forces to move this industry in a certain direction so that we are uh, performing, we are making Philadelphia a green city. Um, this, uh, the, pic the map on the left shows you the number of projects that we've already done in Philadelphia. Uh, and it says over 500, but we have about 700 projects done in Philadelphia now, uh, including porous streets. We have uh, 25 porous streets, porous asphalt. I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, going in Philadelphia. This is, um, this is a picture that, uh, that we took in 2001 in Portland, Oregon. Okay. It means nothing. It's not saving the world, but it is a uh, roof leader bringing water from the roof of a house down to the, down to the ground level and into the sewer system. And here they found a way to add a little volume, slow the water down a little bit, put some plantings in, maybe suck up some of that water, and make something interesting. Maybe it's art, maybe you consider it artistic, maybe you don't. But it's just looking at a pipe and looking at it a little bit differently. And it's really the basis of everything that we do is, is you know, how do you, how do you change things? Because if you think about a city, a city is built at a gradient. The gradient starts on your roof. The roof water runs down, goes to the roof, uh, roof leader, goes down to the, to the sidewalk or the back alley or wherever it goes. From there, it goes down to some area where it can either infiltrate or go down into a drain. The drain, the sidewalks, the streets, the curbs, everything is slanted, is at a gradient, going to an inlet. So in essence, what we're trying to do here in Philadelphia and elsewhere is to change the gradient of the entire city. Okay. We're looking to uh, do this kind, of, this kind of work all over the city. This is, uh, this is Rotterdam. Uh, this is a, uh, a skate park that doubles as a stormwater retention system. Also, we saw this in the, about 2004, 2005. We can't do this in Philadelphia because we have too many lawyers. <laughs> but, you know, again, it's just how do you look at everything that you have and everything that you've built and will rebuild over the next 25, 50, 100 years and think about it a little bit differently and get to that point where you have a sustainable city that also has other benefits for the community, whether it be uh, economic benefits, environmental benefits, or, or social benefits for the, for the public. This is one of our first projects that we did. This is a uh, basketball court in West Philadelphia. Uh, it's a porous asphalt basketball court. It's, um, it's, in, it's in West Philadelphia. It's called Salzburger Middle School. And what's interesting here is that we spent a lot of money building this court because no one had ever built porous asphalt in Philadelphia before. So the contractor we hired was one of our contractors who do sewer jobs for us, and they had no idea how to do this. The design engineers didn't know how to do this. The factory had to figure out how to close down their factory so that they could uh, uh, make the right asphalt rather than use the asphalt that they normally use. And everybody had to learn something new. So this, this is a pretty expensive basketball court was the first one. And this, and this one basketball court does not change the world, but we have a lot of basketball courts in Philadelphia. So as we start thinking about how we do this and make improvements to kids' lives, because the courts in Philly are not very good, um, how do we make improvements to people's lives? How do we improve the drainage system? And how do we do it less expensively? Well, now we know how. This is just more examples of, uh, pro of demonstration projects of living walls along the, uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, Liberty Bell Center. And uh, some more projects. And, you know, and, and just looking at our city, transforming our city, and looking at what I'll show you, stormwater tree trenches and, and rain barrels and green roofs and whatever you can do in order to make your city green and beautiful and support the water management. Uh, this, was, uh, this was one of our first big projects. It's a big project because uh, one of the big secrets for us is to get the water utility out of this business and make it just part of normal, standard practice for city planning, 
uh, licenses, inspections, contractors, developers, engineers, to this is just to be the normal way to, of building. And in this lot here, uh, there was a, uh, a, a, an ash baseball field. There was a big empty lot. It's right by our, our, uh, our L train in, in, uh, Fra in Frankfurt. And it's got a lot to offer, but, not, but in this way it offers nothing to anybody. And here they built a school, managed water, they, did, they put in uh, uh, porous pavement parking, the rainwater cisterns, the uh, uh, underground detention facility, green roofs, uh, uh, everything you can imagine up to uh, geothermal wells. And put it all up in this top area here as a new school. And they moved, they moved these children from the old school to this new school, and attendance went up and grades went up and the level of happiness of the, of the children went up. Um, we, we rebuilt the, the ash baseball field to make it grass. Uh, we put murals on, we added trees, and then we started moving out into the community and doing uh, planting trees and stormwater tree trenches uh, to make green streets coming into this area. So this is a, this is a way of, of looking at a city, a small microcosm of a city, and looking at uh, schools, and playgrounds, rec centers, homes, private and public facilities, and how we all work together to recreate our city. This was, a, this was an opportunity that happened because of, of a number of, of, of things coming together, but the most important thing is, is that we were ready as a city with the regulations, with the ideas, with the, with the ways of doing these things so that when all these different parties happened to come together, it was all there for them. And that's, and that's the idea of how you make this into a sustainable long-term program. This is South Philadelphia. This is uh, one, of our, one of our famous streets with row houses. And here we look and see how can we make a green street out of this. Well, you can plant trees, of course, but more, more than just the trees, uh, you have uh, these uh, stone detention systems underneath. So you're managing the water. The water is being held there. Uh, it's providing water for the tree roots. Uh, we're designing the right trees for this area. We're looking at the bump outs uh, to ease traffic conditions. Here's another corner street. Kind of concepts we're doing again. Here we're not only managing the storm water, we're improving the, the appearance. We're hopefully raising property values for the people who live in this area. Uh, we are reducing the distance that someone has to walk to cross the street because you got these bump outs on both sides and uh, we are providing for uh, for bike paths so it's a complete street it's a green street how do you put everything together do things that uh, everyone in, in planning in philadelphia and elsewhere are looking to do at the same time working with communities putting in uh, uh, planters uh, working uh, improving those communities and communities is have incredible opportunities because uh, particularly in the poor areas of philadelphia uh, where there's so much that's needed, so much. And, and here you need, you need everything. In order to do this on a block in Philadelphia, you need, you need an organizer. You need somebody who's going to knock on the doors. Uh, you, need, uh, you need somebody who, who understands this vision, a leader, a facilitator for a process. You need a planner. You need a designer. You need an engineer. You need a contractor. You need money. And you need support from your community. And you need somebody to operate and maintain these trees and, this, and the other the systems that you put in. So um, as, as you look at these, uh, you look at these things, there's, there's jobs, there's uh, economy, there's improvements to the neighborhood, there's uh, uh, property value increases, and a number of things that are happening. Looking on a broader scale for the city of Philadelphia, looking at this whole concept of land and water, uh, here's another relationship we have with the park system. The park system's looking at uh, both individual parks and rec centers throughout the city, and also the big park systems in Philadelphia, and again, looking at stormwater management, how you put everything together. Um, and looking at new ideas for the future, and you can't really read this slide, but uh, transforming a city, looking at the land issues, looking at the water issues, putting those things together, and creating a, a good outcome for the city of Philadelphia. Okay. Here's an example. This is one of our first uh, uh, projects called Sailor Grove. It's a, it was a park that wasn't very well used. It was in a triangle, meaning uh, there were streets on all sides of it. And we came in and we uh, uh, diverted some of the storm flow and created a wetland. 
and uh, it's re it really became a beautiful site in Philadelphia where uh, once nobody came, and now it's a now it's a landmark site for Philadelphia, and it manages manages stormwater going into the Wissahickon Creek. Uh, schools are really important to us because schools not only represent uh, a lot of land area of, of misapplied asphalt, uh, but you know, here you have the you know this, this entire picture, I mean, this entire area is draining into this drain, and what's not going in there is running off into the street, going into the curb. Curbs going into the, into the drain, going to the same place. So it's a real, you know, it just seems like it's really easy to get this out. And so we've been working with Dr. Height, who's our superintendent of schools, and we're on this uh, program together to, to green 200 schoolyards. And this is just a dramatization of what it would look like, but you can see how things can change and how you can take a schoolyard and make it safer, make it more attractive, have uh, environmental science education, other types of education uh, going on at the school all at the same time, and manage water. We've built, uh, we've built about five of these so far, uh, three, four, five of these. We have another 10 or so on the books ready to come, and we're looking to do 200 schoolyards in Philadelphia. Another idea of just land and water, looking at, uh, you know, just uh, big box stores that were built alongside the Delaware River because the Delaware River was not really of value to anything, uh, but how you convert that and take this to this open space and convert it to stormwater managed area with also access to the waterfront. So whereas as a water utility in the past, we were responsible for fishable, swimmable, those are the Clean Water Act standards, now we're looking at fishable, swimmable, safe, attractive, and accessible, okay? Because you bring those things together, and now my community, my constituents, people who are paying my water bills, get to understand and get to get some pleasure out of the money that's being spent to improve the water quality. Uh, this is a park in uh, northwest Philadelphia, and uh, this is a stream that we made. This water in this stream is coming from the street. This is uh, taking uh, rainwater that would normally go down the street and go into a rain gutter, into, a, um, into an inlet, and we've diverted it and brought it into this park, made a water f series of water features. The bottom of this feature, which you can't see right now, is a, is a wetland, so the water is infiltrating into the ground, adding something back to the community, adding, a, adding something, something more pleasant, and also reducing the impacts of flood and overflows. This is, a, this is a, just throw this in because this is a green roof on a house in, in, in South Philadelphia where everyone said you could never build a green roof on a, a row home in Philadelphia, and that's not true anymore. We started off with, uh, uh, in 2001, there was one green roof in Philadelphia, and today there's uh, over 100. And it's just growing as a, as a mechanism for managing water and improving, improving your property value and also giving you a little bit more space for you to live. Uh, this is the Cobbs Creek, which empties into the uh, uh, Delaware River. And what you see here is one of our sewers. One of the, I told you about our intercepting sewers. This is an intercepting sewer. It intercepts the water and prevents, this, prevents it from going out into the creek. The only problem is, is that this, this sewer used to, be in, used to be underground. And because of the flows, the high flows, because of storm events on the creek, the, the sewer is now exposed, so we had to do something about it. And we used a technique, this was the first time we used it, called fluvial geomorphology, where we look at the stream and we look at the energy in the stream and we redesign the stream uh, with the energy in mind and also the access and attractiveness and safety of, those, of the area. And we manage the, we, we can now manage this creek. So we're looking at, there are about 15 miles of urban stream left in Philadelphia. 15 miles, you saw the, some of the pictures before. And uh, our plan over the next 20 years is to rebuild every mile of that. So this is a start, this is only 1,000 feet. And then we did a couple more projects and we have another one underway. Uh, but the plan is to rebuild all those creeks and put them back into balance with nature. So this is, a, this is just a big idea of where we're going. This is Philadelphia um, now and 
this is some vision of where Philadelphia can be, and we probably will not have, have this much green and this much green roofs, but the idea is that water can be a very powerful force to use to help change a city and make it into a green city, a sustainable city, a, a great water city for the, for the 21st century. So thank you very much. Um, So hopefully, you know, and this is the, uh, um, the takeaway, is, is that there are ways to adapt modern water policy to encourage this kind of innovation in a city. And I'm happy to take questions. Somebody has a question. Hey. Make it easy. You mentioned green, build, green roofs. How feasible is that for, for older buildings? I imagine there's some limitations. There, there are limitations on old buildings because uh, green roofs are heavier than, uh, than a non-green roof. So you have to make sure, you have to hire an engineer to make sure the roof can, can handle the, the weight. So there is a, it is much more being used for, exi for new roofs than retrofits for old roofs. But we are starting to see more and more retrofits because as the green roof business grows, from the first one that we had in Philly, which was uh, about this much hard soil, and then some plantings on top, to now this much soil that is a different type of soil mixture that's very lightweight, that we now have new ways of, of doing green roofs that are very lightweight and very supported, can very well support um, um, uh, retrofit. So we're seeing it more and more. And the industry changes every year. Okay, yeah, this, uh, the interesting story about green roofs is that when I uh, uh, first brought in in 2003 a guy to talk to my engineers about green roofs, everyone sat there like this. Because everyone knew you couldn't put a green roof on your roof because it's going to have a leak. You won't be able to find the leak. You won't be able to fix it. It's too expensive. And every time he turned around to point at the, at the green roof example that he had up on the board, uh, all the engineers would start to snicker. And today, 100, 100 green roofs in our city. OK, thank you. Sure. Hello. Oh. Is this on? Hello. Um, my name is Benjamin Martin. I'm a junior environmental science major at the college. And first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. To see the work that you're doing in Philadelphia is really an inspiration for us in Lancaster and other cities that are trying to recreate these green infrastructure initiatives to reduce stormwater. Um, Lancaster, as you probably know, is trying to tackle much of the same problems that you are as an old city with a combined sewer system. And um, one recent development that we've seen in our own city is an implementation of a water discharge tax on homeowners to try and uh, create homeowner responsibility for the water that's leaving their property and to reduce stormwater overall. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that this is a good measure to reduce stormwater and is this something that you could potentially be seen in Philadelphia? Did you call it a tax? Uh, yeah. Whatever you'd like to call well, it. Well, us in the industry, we call it a fee. Okay. And anybody who thinks that government is not charging you one way or another to remove the stormwater from your property and manage it, uh, you're just being mistaken. It's just a, it's, it's a hidden fee, a hidden tax. And what's happening now is uh, what, what, what had happened is that it had, uh, the value of rainwater was zero. The, the value of runoff is zero. What do you do with it as a city is you put it into a drain. You waste it, right? Now, with a tax, fee, whatever you want to call it, uh, placed on homeowners, placed on businesses, now there's a commodity. Now there's something that, since there's a fee, there can also be a credit if you no longer provide that water over to the, over to the municipality. And that's what we're using in Philadelphia. We've, uh, politically, it's really hard to do. And, uh, we almost all got fired for doing it, but we've created this fee system that has created a commodity and created a new private enterprise of folks who are going around uh, offering private landowners, uh, including big industries in Philadelphia, of, of 50 acres and more, to manage the stormwater in their property, reduce their costs, and split the, split the profits from that. So as, as rainwater takes its real value, then you can, um, 
have a commodity that is worth managing. So yes. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Emily Meneghin. I'm a senior um, theater and Italian major. So this uh, presentation was very inspirational and enlightening. Um, seeing the maps and, but more importantly, seeing the different ways water can be managed that can bring so much other positive things to a city and to like urban development and things like that. But I was, I was struck particularly by some numbers that you said at the beginning of the presentation about how much, um, you think you said 98 or 95 percent of this kind of funding comes from us, whereas for roads, for example, 85 percent of that comes from like the top down. I suppose you were listening. Okay, good. And exactly I was right. what? I said you were listening. Exactly yeah, right. Yeah, nice, <laughs> cool. Um, so what I was wondering is, I think it's almost, I think it's um, ideal mm -hmm. to have this this active, um, non-mandated like citizenry to 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 do these kinds of things like I'm, I want to look at like my apartment and see if like and I can like make the water trickle down and to grow my basil but I want to know I think it needs to be I think the government like needs to be also like paying for this in a way so like to what extent does it like what I want to ask is like to what extent is it going to be a product of individual actions and to what extent is it we actually value this, so let's right. actually value this, like right. in a structured format. Yeah. Uh, like, like much uh, of the infrastructure around the country, and like the green infrastructure, what I did not talk about was the gray infrastructure that we have that also needs money and priorities. Now, we have a lot of need for money and priorities in the water industry, and I'm not just saying that as a Philadelphian, I'm saying that as a US citizen. Uh, it's happening everywhere, and it's very scary when you look at 50, 100 years down the road of the kinds of monies that's available, and uh, we've all heard of the term of uh, deferred maintenance, and deferred maintenance is happening in our roadways and it's happening in our water systems, and there really is no choice because uh, uh, we cannot politically or, or financially raise rates enough to do everything we want to do. Uh, so green infrastructure is a big piece of that. Uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny piece because you know where. Where I look for my federal money is in the, uh, I don't expect them to give me money for trees. So I'm looking for money for pipes. And then I can use my money for the things that I know are more sustainable. But yes, it's a, it's a very big issue for us. And uh, I do not see the federal government coming around anytime soon with any pot of, pot of money. Although every now and then you hear them talk about uh, uh, infrastructure and jobs, mm -hmm. which seems to make a lot of sense. We uh, uh, we generate 10,000 jobs a year in the city of Philadelphia from the from the one billion dollars of work that we do every year. So it's a there is a good connection, and if you can, if you know if you know your congressman, write to him. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Shear. I'm a sophomore environmental studies major, geoscience minor. Um, how much of a say do you have over the city if they um, are trying to start a new? development project, so like if they're building a new set of buildings or a park or something, do you have any say in the way the water should be treated for that? Yeah, and I, and I apologize for, for glossing over that, that part of this, but uh, very much, you know, I, I, what I was showing you is pretty much the, the big government piece of this and how we design, build, operate. But uh, two very big other pieces of this, one is the stormwater fee which creates a private incentive to do this work. And the second, and, and the second one is, a development, is a development regulations, which is another thing that we almost all got fired over, but we've, we've survived through it, of managing so that every, every building that's, that's rebuilt in the city of Philadelphia now has to manage stormwater. In the past, it didn't have to, because our pipes, you know, our pipes are big enough, as long as the water as long as we had a big hole at the end of the pipe going out to the river, you know, uh, somebody comes to you and says, do you have enough capacity in your pipe to, uh, to handle this, uh, this five-acre building? You go, of course, put it in. So today we're, uh, we're looking at development regulations and we're, we're seeing that, that for our city, about 0.5% of our city redevelops each year. Point, that's a lot. So in, in, ten, in 10 years, that's, 
5% of the impervious cover we're looking to get through all these programs is happening just through an evolution of the city. So it's, uh, development regulations are incredibly important and uh, a great passive way of, of, uh, of privatizing so that it doesn't become a public cost, uh, but privatizing the, the cost of the program. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Rachel Clifford. I'm a freshman here and I'm a joint major in biology and environmental science. Um, I'm from California, and so we've been dealing with the drought a lot recently, and I wanted to know more about your, uh, you talked a lot about water divergence, and I wanted to know uh, about your systems of water conservation, like rain catching systems, that kind of thing. Yeah, we have, um, uh, so I started calling Las Vegas opposite water world, because like, you know, here we are trying to build rain gardens in, in people's backyards, and in Las Vegas, uh, the utility there is trying to convince people to pull up their grass in their gardens and put Xeriscape down. And uh, my, my good friends in Los Angeles, uh, it's incredible what they're doing. They're doing the exact same things we're doing. They're doing it for very different reasons, because their, their reasons is to, you know, they uh, take the L.A. River and, uh, and manage that water in L.A. and keep the water there in big cisterns and tanks so that they have the water for alternate uses. In San Diego, they're doing other things like uh, desalinization and other projects. But it's all, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating how even though the issues and conditions are so much different across the country and across the world, uh, there's really only a, 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 a so many tools in our toolbox. And we're all doing the same thing, just using them in a slightly different way. Thank you. Um. You might be familiar with uh, things like the Smart Cities Council um, and this, uh, you know, movement from industry leaders like GE, Siemens, and, and whatnot um, to partner with governments to to sort of bridge the gap between, um, you know, the public and private sector side of this. Um, but in terms of, you know, monetizing these these solutions and um, uh, you know harnessing the scalability of you know, the private sector um, solutions they can provide. Do you see that as promising, you know, specifically in, uh, I guess, you know, your capacity here? Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it seemed to be working in, in other places. Such uh, as? You know, China, where, there, where there's just a massive amount of um, uh, public support, uh, and then followed by you know, investment from, from people that are sort of, uh, you know, yeah. jumping in after that. But in the United States, you know, where, where the, that's not really the case, um, are there a lot of... I, I, I think you may, I mean, I, I understand the perception, but mm -hmm. I think the reality is, is that there's a lot of private business, public-private partnerships in the United States. And, you know, for, for my utility, I have a uh, public-private partnership where we uh, uh, take all our waste gas at our wastewater plant and we generate three quarters of our electric needs at our facility and this is a, a six megawatt facility so it's pretty it's pretty large um, and we also do it with our pelletization plant where we have a 25 million dollar a year contract with a private company so and uh, and our meters also so there's a lot of diff there are different ways of privatizing and one of the most interesting things and you mentioned China and you talk about India, you talk about some, uh, some other countries that may be even less fortunate, is that uh, there are ways, you know, people, there's not enough water going around the country, going around the world now, and there's lots of world water problems, but they're all solvable. And the, the companies are there to solve them, and the technologies are there to solve them. It's a question of two things. One is money, who's paying for it, and is there a stable government that will protect the industry when they go in there. So in China, I'm not really sure what's, what's, uh, what's going on with China, but uh, I, I, I would have supposed that it was more government controlled there. But, mm -hmm. uh, but there are private businesses and, and uh, you know, the private sector of the water industry is a very big part of our industry, a very big important part because it's where a lot of the innovations are happening. Um, and, there's a, and there is a constant argument about which is better, public and private. And, uh, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating discussion, and I, I'm, I'm still kind of split on, on what the answer is. Thanks. Yeah. 
My name is Colin Falvey. I'm a freshman. And kind of more about the fee you were talking about with the runoff. I was just wondering how that was specifically managed. Because I know you can't put a little water turbine out there and figure out how much water is running from this person's roof. So I was just wondering about that. Uh, OK. Um, and thank you for saying fee and not tax. Um, but basically, it costs my utility $125, $130 million a year to manage stormwater. That's you know, that's 79,000 inlets. That's piping. That's uh, you know, it's it's uh, whatever you know, what other costs associated with that. And uh, so we have 125 million dollars, and we have to divide it up equally and fairly. So the first thing we did is look at residentials, which are 500,000 accounts, and everyone else. And we realized that there was about the impervious cover for those two groups was about equal. So we took the 125 million, we cut it in half, and we said the residentials are going to pay for half of that, which is 65 million or whatever dollars is split up among 500,000 accounts. Comes out to about $12 an account to, per month. Uh, we look at the at the uh, commercial land, and there we were able to do. Uh, we got we got a young smart engineer that we ran into in about 2003 who was able to figure out how to take the uh, city's tax base and manage the maps in a way that we could uh, take all our, all our water accounting systems and overlay it into the parcel-based system. So we were able to look at every parcel. And we were able to see how much impervious cover and impervious cover there is, and then take all that and take those numbers, just divide it through and find a cost per 1,000 square feet. So we charge, uh, we have a, uh, a charge for a thousand, per thousand square feet for impervious cover and a cost per uh, thousand square feet of gross area for your property. Okay, thank so, you. So, yeah. But it was a, it's a, a very complicated process and it took, it took till the 21st century for us to be able to do it. Hi, I'm Ryan Stull. I'm a sophomore biology major. Um, I know that a lot of your talk was talking about uh, rainfall uh, throughout most of the year, but another big source of water for uh, Philadelphia is snow in the winter. I was wondering how that's managed, how you know the large melt-off in the spring is sort of managed, and how like the salt water during the winter months is kind of managed again. Well, it's, it's fascinating because the, um, the salt water um, doesn't affect us too much in Philadelphia because our River is estuary, mm -hmm. so we have our so our river itself, the Delaware and the Schuylkill up to the Fairmount Dam, is is part of the ocean. Uh, so we're not that concerned there, but we are concerned about our water treatment facilities. We have two on the Schuylkill and one on the Delaware River, uh, all at the farthest northest end. So it's not impacted by our street management, but it is very much impacted on the, the management of what happens. Uh, upstate in Montgomery County, Bucks County, Berks County, and that has a very big effect on us. And um, uh, we did we did uh, exceed for the first time in a very long time a secondary maximum contaminant level for sodium because of the salt, and we're very concerned about that. So it's a very big again land management issue, land management. How do you manage the land? What do you put on the land to deal with snow and and other things, and, and, and how does that impact the aquatic life? So it is a very big issue. Thank you.